Okay. So, uh, thanks to everybody who's gathered here. Uh, sorry for a bit of a delay. Uh, you know, it's rainy Seattle night. What are you going to do? Um, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we want to begin by acknowledging that we present this program uh, from the traditional lands of the Lummi and Nooksack people. Uh, the Walking Museum acknowledges that we gather on the traditional territory of the Lactamesh, Lummi, and Nooksack people. Uh, who have lived in the Coast Salish region since time immemorial. The museum honors our relationship with all of our Coast Salish neighbors and our shared responsibilities to their homeland where we all reside today. Um, the presentation that we're, that we're all about to enjoy uh, is part of Humanities Washington's Speaker Bureau's program. Uh, Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to opening minds and bridging divides by creating spaces to explore different perspectives. Uh, thanks to the National Endowment for Humanities, uh, the Washington Secretary of State, the Thomas Foley Institute for Public Policy, um, and generous private donors. Um, so check out, your, check out the Humanities Washington website if you haven't. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. Um, and yeah, the Humanities Washington website. Humanities, Humanities Washington, yeah. Uh, so, and then, you know, all these programs are meant to generate an open and honest conversation on a lot of topics, uh, some of which are controversial, and we encourage differing points of view and ask that you treat this topic and each other with respect. Um, so that said, um, Jake Prindes is going to be our speaker tonight. He's a renowned Chicano artist and the owner and co-director of the Nipantla uh, Cultural Arts Gallery in Seattle. His work is an amalgamation of, life ex of his life experiences, a representation of his Chicano background, and a reflection of his time living in both Seattle and Los Angeles. So we're going to welcome Jake Prendez both to the Wacom Museum and to our virtual platforms, uh, and we'll kick off the show. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Do I need to keep the mask on from here? Oh. Do I need to keep the mask on from here? Okay, cool. Well, so sorry about the delay. I thought three hours was going to be enough time to get here from Seattle. <laughs> it was not. All right, take this off because I like to walk around. Um, so again, my name is Jake Prendez, and I'm a Chicano artist. Um, I was born um, in Southern California, a little town outside of Riverside called San Jacinto, um, but raised in Seattle area, Bothell. and. Um, Moved back to L.A. after college and was in kind of the East L.A. area for about 15 years almost. And then uh, moved back about five years ago and um, been working up here ever since. And um, deep in kind of rooted in kind of the Latinx art experience in Seattle and kind of highlighting and amplifying what we're doing um, here in Seattle. And I think a lot of people forget that there's a vibrant... Latinx arts um, movement happening here. Um, we think of LA, we think of Texas, we think of a lot of different places, um, but you know, Seattle has a vibrant movement. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about how art, how we shifted the idea of art from the uh, commodity to this idea of art for the people and how we use art as a, <clears throat> a means of spreading social justice movements, getting the word out, how the production has changed over the years, and how um, you know, each generation of artists brings something to the table and influence the next generation of artists, and, and really finding those links um, between artists. And uh, we're gonna start off with Mexican muralism, which isn't the beginning of revolutionary social justice art, but I'm using it as kind of a springboard. Um, to start from, and I, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. If that, and then what I'm going to do is deconstruct my own artwork and how it all relates um, to everything I've talked about. And you know, I don't operate in a bubble, and um, the things I do are influenced by those who came before me. So does that sound good to everyone? Cool. Okay. So um, Mexican muralism kind of is birthed out of the Mexican. Um, revolution in the 1920s and 30s. Um, up until then, Mexico was kind of seen as more nation states versus this kind of unified Mexico that we think of today. And what they wanted to do was create this unified sense of Mexico after the revolution to kind of bring people together as a country. And one of the things they do is they enlist um, 
Jose Vasconcelos, who was the Secretary of Education, um, to kind of help facilitate that. And so what he comes up with this idea of creating murals in public places, right? Um, and when they first start doing this, the murals are very steeped in kind of indigenismo and kind of indigenous roots and kind of Mexican indigenous roots. So there's a lot of like Aztecs and things like that. So they're going around the country and they're painting these murals in public places, um, in um, schools and public walls and things. And it, what it does is it really shifts this idea of art as a commodity that kind of the richest people can you know, afford, like the kings can get their portraits and things like that made, um, to really this idea of uh, like a mural where it's for the people. Like you cannot take this whole wall and put it in your, your room, right? Um, that it's for the people and it's, you can get your message out through these murals. And actually one of the people that I think is, no one really talks about, but is so influential in this movement is Dr. Ott, A-L-T, or A-T-L. Um, and he is actually the professor, the teacher, that is the one that's teaching Diego, Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, Clemente Orozco, all these people that become famous muralists and get all the attention, but he was their teacher. He was the one that was talking about these ideas of kind of these fresco paintings and how, um, you know, the shifting of, you know, art for the people. Um, so, Los Tres Grandes, those are kind of the three artists that are most known for Mexican muralism. So even though there's a ton of muralists out there, these are the ones that are the famous three, right? So you have David Alfaro Siqueiros, Jose Clemente Orozco, and Diego Rivera. Now, Diego Rivera is probably most famous for being Frida Kahlo's husband. <laughs> but um, what I love about this mural, and I love about this being projected so big versus like on a little Zoom screen, um, is you really get to see um, kind of this shift, right, where in the beginning, they are very steeped in kind of this indigenous um, uh, life and capturing our roots. Um, but these artists are, very, are leftist artists who um, staunch socialists and start really talking about workers' rights, the workers' struggle, um, and their work becomes more influenced by that. And what's great about this mural is you literally see that shift in one mural where on one side you have kind of the indigenous kind of life and then kind of the mechanization of Mexico. So you have the statue of Colique, who's kind of this like Aztec mother god, right? And on one side, she it's the statue. On the other side, it's the machine. So he's talking about the mechanization of the country and how we're moving into kind of the... Um, industrial revolution and you know and you have all the workers in there so um, I think that's a great example of um, that shift. Now while Diego Rivera and David Alfaro Siqueiros are staunch socialists, um, Jose Clemente Orozco is not. He sees socialism as problematic just as religion is, just as Nazi and Nazism is, that they're all problematic. And so, what I, in this mural, which is in um, Guanajuato, I think, is it Guadalajara? Okay, yeah, so Guadalajara, um, and I got, I got to see this one in person, and those are the two places I've been, so I'm like, which one was it? Um, but yeah, so you can see you have kind of the hammer and sickle, kind of in this bowels of hell, so kind of talking about like socialism, you have the Christian cross, you have kind of armbands with a swastika and things like that in there. So you see where he's talking about, like all of these things are, are issues and problematic. David Alfaro Siqueiros does not have that issue. <laughs> and literally puts Karl Marx at the front of the mural. Um, and then you have like the original Zapatistas, right? With Emiliano Zapata on the other side and kind of talking about the kind of workers coming together. 
So what happens is a lot of these muralists start teaching in the United States. Um, so David Alfaro Siqueiros, all of them, um, Diego Rivera, they all get these gigs in the U.S. teaching and painting murals. Start influencing artists. Now, the term wasn't coined until like actually the 1970s to kind of talk about it, but um, it comes out of the FDR's New Deal and um, the Work Progress Administration creates the, um, the Federal Arts Program under the WPA. Um, under the WPA, and so what it does is it puts artists to work, right? So they're creating screenplays, they're creating murals, they're creating um, propaganda posters and all these different things, and so it's the whole idea is putting artists back to work. Well, a lot of these artists are literally studying under these Mexican muralists, so they're deeply inspired by them. Uh, for example, there's an artist, um, Pablo O'Higgins, who was originally Peter O'Higgins, right? start studying under Diego Rivera, it's like, I'm Pablo now, <laughs> and, uh, and it ends up going out to Mexico and doing a bunch of murals and living and staying with Diego Rivera. Um, but he painted a mural at a Union shipyard in Seattle, and when that um, building was being taken down, um, they saved that mural, and it was stored at University of Washington. And in, I think, in the 90s, I believe it was, um, students discovered this mural that was kind of in storage and demanded that this be put back on display. And um, so if you go to Kane Hall today, um, that mural is on display in Kane Hall. Um, and I also geek out too, you know, since I studied this, you know, in my graduate work and I'll end up in a, um, in a uh, post office somewhere where they still have one of these murals um, on display. And it's like I geek out and I'm like, oh my God, this is a, you know, <laughs> a, you know, mural from the Depression era and, da, 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 and people are like, dude, just buy your stamps and shut up. I'm like, all right. So I just want to give you some kind of examples of this um, social realist era art. And it's really highlighted by kind of making the working class, the worker, heroic, right, and giving them value, um, but it's also showing them authentic and kind of the nitty-gritty and um, not cleaning it up. So what happens is, again, these artists, they become professors, they become teachers, and they start inspiring the next generation of artists. And by the time we get to um, the civil rights movement era in the 60s, there's a shift in kind of the production of art, right? So you, you have these beautiful, amazing murals um, kind of being produced in the 30s, throughout the 40s, and even into the 50s. Um, and so by the time we get to civil rights movement art, what, what, what does that look like? What, do, what are they producing? Anyone in the audience? Posters, right? So silk screening becomes in vogue. Um, and what's great about silkering is it's mass produced. It, you can easily create a bunch of these posters. So again, it's about access to art. It's about putting art in the hands of the people um, and where we've literally taken kind of your social justice message off the wall, literally into the hands of the people. And you can mail these out. You can mass produce thousands of them and get them out to a march and things like that. Um, yeah, so you have uh, one, you know, a poster about the great the boycotts. Um, you have an Emory Douglas piece in the middle, and Emory Douglas was kind of like the official Black Panther Party artist, and people would like collect the news, the Black Panther newspaper for like the new Emory Douglas piece, and they'd be all excited and like, yeah, I got that new Emory Douglas piece in there. Um, so he became really famous um, and collected, you know, just by the people, right? And then um, I wanted to pay homage to um, Yolanda uh, Lopez, who actually just passed away um, maybe two weeks ago, if that. Um, but she produced the uh, Who's the Illegal Alien Pilgrim and really revolutionized um, Chicano art um, 
and you know what she was creating just um, was absolutely amazing so I wanted to make sure that she was included in this presentation now when we get to kind of contemporary art they look very similar right um, the style wise you have you know new issues coming up right new social justice causes so you have black lives matter you have immigration um, and other things but does anyone know what's different about these from kind of the civil rights movement art digital women good observation but <laughs> answer is digital um, so what's happening is um, you know with social media and things like that um, we've literally taken it you know from your hands to the world so where you had to at one point like go to a mural to see it right and get that message to it moving to oh wait I can you know get this poster printed and now you know I can take it off the wall to now I just can upload it on my phone and send it around the world and now I'm Instagram famous um, so yeah so every kind of generation kind of puts their spin on it and that cause is just keeps growing and growing um, and we're getting further and further you know and reaching more people okay yeah, I'm gonna skip those videos because I'm, I'm late I'm sorry um, but I want to deconstruct the art that I'm producing right um, so this series um, so I did these murals in Guanajuato Mexico um, God, man, it was, might be 10 years now, um, but they brought 10 artists, so 10 of us from LA went out to Guanajuato and created these murals. So it was an interno, like a convent, um, or like a boarding school, so it's this, these, um, it's for abused women and children. Um, so some of, a lot of the young girls were orphans or in a foster system, and so these nuns are running this um, interno and what was happening was it's getting tagged up really bad on the outside and they wanted to detour the graffiti and um, they wanted an artist to create this mural and a friend of our a friend of ours who was in town at the time um, they were talking to him he runs a program called Las Fotos and um, teaches young girls photography and things like that um, and they, he was like, yeah, I know, I can get some artists from LA to come out here and paint this mural for you. So we were running this program called Art Jam Mondays, and we were just basically at Cal State Northridge, we'd open up the Chicano house, um, which was a building on campus, and we would just paint, and we'd invite artists like, hey, you know, it's gonna be open, anyone wants to come paint with us, you're more than welcome to, you know, just paint, we have easels and all that. And so it was just everyone works on their own projects that they're working on, but we got to hang out together, work on art and, you know, talk smack and all that. It was fun. Uh, so anyways, one of the people that was going to that was approached and he's like, hey, would you all like to go to Guanajuato, Mexico and do these murals? And we were all like, heck yeah, you know, but they can't pay you anything. So we fundraised for a year and we threw all these art shows and fundraisers and things. And, you know, when we were ready to go, we had the money for plane tickets. We had the money for our hostel. We had the money for food. We had the money for paints. We had the money for, you know, pretty much everything was covered. Um, so we went down there and we get there and the city tells us, you can't paint a mural on this building. It goes against the aesthetic of the city. <laughs> we're like, that's something you could have told us before. <laughs> went. Um, but they were actually really cool and we made this agreement that we, we were going to put them on um, panels and that we could mount these panels and if people objected then they could be removed and put somewhere else um, and so we had this great idea that what if we had the community paint these murals so what we did with these panels were we um, drew them on so we designed this these murals and drew them on and then we just flyered the city for like a couple days you know te invita pintando el mural por el buen pastor and i don't know if you've ever had to 
flyer for something out in public, people treat you like you're, you have leprosy and, um, but apparently no one's ever flyered over there because like everyone was taking the flyers and they were like, ay, que chido, like they, you know, how cool. And, and so the day that we, um, you know, were ready, you know, we had all the paints there, we had, you know, the tarp, everything, um, brushes and it was kind of this paint by number. So we had even the kind of printed out color version of this, like this is what it's supposed to look like, you know, so this is where you're going to paint green, you know, audit. And it was amazing. We had old folks, we had kids, we had college students, just the whole community out there painting these murals, right? And then at the end of the day, what we do is we just kind of touch them up, you know, where they went outside the lines, clean it all up. And um, so it was a great experience. And then we did another mural, like just our artist crew on the inside. They, they couldn't stop us from the inside mural. Um, so it was an absolutely great experience. But being there in Guanajuato and kind of being back in the motherland, right, um, was really inspirational. And my art took on just a whole new life. It was, I think, more, there was more ideology in it. There was more, um, it was more planned out. And just this, I think, connection with my ancestors, um, this kind of journey really, I think, started from that. And the first series I did when I got back was this cultural resilience, we still exist. And so what I did were these portraits of friends and family and then I painted the, these like Aztec symbols over their portraits to represent this invisible culture that we walk around with every day. I just got tired of people talking about indigenous communities like Mayan, Aztec, and like, oh, these extinct people. Like, we're not extinct, we're still here, right? Um, and so our culture survives in the way we, the way we cook, the way we dance, the way we work with our elders, the way we raise our children, right? Um, you know, has anyone ever told you like, oh, you, you laugh just like your grandpa or, oh, you have the same smile as your mom, right? Like that's genetic memory. That's like in us, that's in our DNA, right? Um, so our culture survives within us. And so, um, you know, I just took the portraits of my friends, uh, the one at the top with the Seahawk Jersey, that's actually my son. Um, and then the other guy at the bottom um, when I asked him to model for me, you know, as a uh, friend, prof Chicano States professor, I was like, hey, would you want to model f for this? And he was like, yeah, I'm cool, but I'm not Aztec. You know, like, we're from northern Mexico. Like, I'm Yaqui. And I was like, well, I can use Yaqui symbols on yours. So that's why his are a little bit different. All right. Now, this is a little more of a humorous um, series that I did called um, Dulces. And you have the guy with the beard, he has like the mazapan candy. So if you've ever eaten mazapan, it's kind of like really, uh, it's basically powder, like peanut flavored powdered sugar that's really packed hard. <laughs> and it, cr it falls, you know, it crumbles super easily. Um, so that's why I named that painting, I Fall to Pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the one in the middle with the two crossing churros, that's called Churro No My Life. And then the one, that's actually my daughter with the, um, me the Mexican bread, the concha in the background. And that one's called Don't Be Self Conchas. <laughs> and I tease my daughter because she's very shy and quiet. And I'm like, mija, you're literally the poster child for Don't Be Self Conchas. And you're self conchas. And she's like, I know. Um, yeah, so those, uh, especially the churro and concha one went viral and got me a bunch of like followers on social media. <laughs> All right, now this series is called Mujeres Fuertes. And so um, the first one is called Be Still My Corazon and um, she represents love in all its forms. And I tell the viewer like you get to decide, you know, the meaning of it. Is she, do you feel great about love and she's offering her heart or do you feel crappy about love and she's ripped someone's heart out? It's up to you, you decide. Um, the middle one is kind of Mother Earth and the environment and um, called Life Goes On and the whole thing with the shoe and the cactus. Um, you see in the movie Wally, um, Pixar, um, they, you know, kind of last plant on Earth and they growing out of a little boot. And so I thought, well, what's the most Chicano shoe out there? Chucks. And, um, and then the Nopal growing out of the Chucks. 
And then the last one, she just represents the arts, and um, the model is actually an absolutely amazing artist herself, um, Amelia Cruz. Um, so I wanted to choose an artist to portray an artist. All right, now, um, so I'm working on a series, or continue to be working on this series called Norman Rockwell and Post-Racial America. And what I'm doing is I'm taking these Rockwell images and flipping them in this contemporary lens with POC folk as the um, kind of the center. Now, I absolutely love Norman Rockwell. Um, I'm a huge Norman Rockwell fan. I think he's witty and, um, you know, it's just kind of this slice of Americana, right? But if Norman Rockwell was here today, he would be like, yeah, this is not real, people. Like, I am just kind of really sugarcoating American life, right? And what a lot of people don't know is that he was actually really progressive, especially later in life. He was doing some civil rights paintings and things like that that are beautiful. Um, I will give credit to his wife. I think she was the one that was very progressive and got him to be <laughs> progressive. Um, but yeah, so I think the right has kind of hijacked Norman Rockwell as this kind of America wish we, we wish we had back, right? And I, I don't think that, you know, like I said, if Norman Rockwell was here, he'd be like, well, no, this didn't exist. Like, you can't use this as America we want back if it was never real. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, kind of look, re-examining this. Um, what, this first one I did, um, he had this character, Willie Gillis, kind of the all-American boy during World War II, um, but it was a very kind of, I guess, happy part of war, where like he, they, he's coming home for the holidays, he's at USO parties and things like that. But the last one he did with Willie Gillis was Willie Gillis Goes to College, and it was all about GI soldiers coming back, um, or soldiers coming back on, and getting the opportunity to go to college on the GI Bill. And so you have, you know, Willie Gillis in his dorm room with his war memorabilia. He's got like his medals and his the Nazi helmet and things like that. And so I just thought, like, what would a Chicana's dorm room look like? What would her war memorabilia be? And so I created this one with her protest posters in her window, um, kind of reading her Chicano study books and looking out the window. All right, the next one, um, the original is called Breaking Home Ties, and it was all about rural America getting this opportunity to go to college, and you have this really weathered down, tired looking father, and this kind of really chipper son, you know, getting the opportunity to go to college. Um, and I thought, well, today, who who is that, right? And I thought, that's the migrant farm worker father and the dreamer son that's getting that opportunity um, to go to college. And I tried, you know, much like the father in the original, I tried to give him this very, almost a sad look, right? This bittersweet look. Uh, I used to be a college recruiter for over 10 years and worked with a lot of, you know, migrant families and you would hear a lot like, oh, my kid doesn't need to go to LA to go to college. Like, they can stay here in Bakersfield or, you know, and go to a community college and stay at home. And I think a lot of people looked at that as like, oh, just such a macho father, that machismo, that Mexican machismo, you know? And that really didn't really give like due credit or really look deeply like, what, what are they really saying, right? And a lot of immigrants are coming to this country for a better life for their families, right? I mean, throughout history of this country, we've come for a better life for our families. And part of that is to give our children all the opportunities that we didn't have. So going to college is kind of like, that's the dream I hope my kids can attain. Um, but a lot of migrant folks are treated like dirt. They're treated like the worst, like pariah, like, and it's heartbreaking, right? And the, it's like the only people that look up to them, the only people that see their value are their kids. And it's kind of this like, if my son or daughter goes off to the city, 
goes to college, sees how amazing the world is, all the vastness that opportunities that are out there, why would they ever want to come back here? Why, and if they do come back here, are they going to love me anymore? Are they going to see me the same way the rest of society looks at me? Are they going to now look down on me and think I'm not worthy or I'm not, I don't have value, right? And it's heartbreaking to hear that, you know. Um, and it's like, no, they will love you, I promise. Um, so I tried to kind of capture that in this like kind of bittersweet, I, I wanted to give him all the opportunities that I never had, but in giving him those opportunities, I may lose him. Sorry to bring it down. <laughs> all right, the next one will get back a little more upbeat. So the original, you have the girl that's kind of looking at the magazine. You have the Vogue style model on there, um, looking like her head. And I thought, well, who's, you know, this new generation's heroes, right? Who are young girls looking up to? And I thought of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, and this is called Inspiration of a New Generation. Um, now, when I originally started this painting, um, I had my daughter model for it when she was probably like 12 years old. And I finished this, I think, last year, and she was 21. <laughs> so it took me a long time to kind of, and actually the model on the magazine when I first started was Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> so that's how long it took me to finish this painting. All right, now this one is just, um, I wanted to show you kind of, I revisited the painting, so. Um, the first one I painted in 2008, um, and I love the concept of it. And so the idea is that this Mayan is holding the symbol chinachli, which means seed, and the little girl's holding the symbol for flower, sochil. And so the idea is that our ancestors have planted these seeds that have bloomed into flowers with us, the seventh generation. Like we are the flowers of their hard work, right? Um, now for indigenous communities that seventh generation is an important number, right? It's, we didn't try and make decisions on what was good for us or what was good for our kids, but like seven generations out, what is gonna be a good decision? Um, so, you know, I love the concept, not too happy with the execution. It was one of my first paintings ever. And I'm like, look, I'm like, oh my God, her head's too big and the shading sucks and all that. So I tried to revisit it and like, okay, have I gotten any better in 10 years, right? Um, so hopefully, I think I did, um, and I tried to make it a little more conceptual, and so it's kind of like the Mayans like kind of tagged on the wall, and she's just walking by with an actual flower. And the model for that is my daughter, um, my youngest, um, Catalina, and it's funny, like kind of the older kids, especially the teenagers, they get, because I painted all of them, and they get a little, little like embarrassed that, you know, but not Catalina, she's proud of it, and like, well, like we do pop-ups and she'll stand next to it and be like, that's me. Hey, stranger, that's me. <laughs> All right, now this one's called, a series called Essential Workers. And so obviously it's um, a very um, timely um, series. And so I just wanted to capture kind of these essential workers and I got through two and I wanted to do a bunch more, we'll see. Um, and then I have just kind of the essential love one. And that's my fiance, me, and she's in the back here. I don't want to embarrass her, but. <laughs> but she became my fiance only a week ago. Yeah, so took her to Disneyland and surprised her at the Magic Castle and proposed and put all the kids to work. One of them Zoomed for all the family that couldn't make it. One Instagram lived and one videotaped it, so. It was a group effort. All right, now this is called Contemporary Codices, and so the idea of this one was just um, kind of capturing everyday community, things that you would see in your own neighborhood in the style of our ancestors, right? And these codices, which were kind of like the Mayan and Aztec, like hieroglyphics. Um, yeah, so, you know, you, I have a bunch of these. So you have, like, the ice cream man. You have the graduating students. You have kind of the Black Lives Matter um, folks. Um, I have, like, a break dancer. I have a girl taking a selfie of herself. I got a mariachi band. I got um, an artist. I got a 
bunch of different ones, a father and daughter and, um, and all that. But yeah, the idea is just, if we were still creating these codices like our ancestors, what would they look like today? All right, and so this is actually gonna be the last slide. And um, I wanted just to show you kind of the progression of a painting from start to finish and uh, what goes into it. So for this one, you know, the first you have the sketch and then you have kind of the undercoating. And usually that undercoating stage is where I'm like really not happy about my painting. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna throw this out the window. I can't stand it. Um, but when I start putting the shadows and highlights and everything, it just starts popping more. It has that dimension. Um, it starts looking a little more real instead of flat. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's okay now. Um, and then you have kind of where I'm putting in like the background. And then the last step in this painting was with like a paint pen, just drawing those symbols, which was very scary because um, you have like a painting, you're like, oh, I really love this painting. And so then it's like last step with a permanent pen. I hope I don't F it up, <laughs> right? Um, so luckily I didn't F it up. All right, well, here's, you know, how you can go ahead and get a hold of us. Um, so, you know, as mentioned, you know, me and Judy run the Napantla Cultural Arts Gallery in, uh, we're kind of on the border of White Center and um, West Seattle. And um, I think we're the only Latinx public art space in the state of Washington, um, surprisingly. I mean, there's some private studios and things like that, but I think uh, as far as like a public gallery, I think we're the only ones. Um, but, you know, there's kind of three parts in the Pantla. There's the gallery, which we change exhibitions every month. Um, and then there's a gift shop where we highlight um, artists. You know, we have a lot of local artists, but are also folks from LA, San Antonio, Oakland, all over. Um, and then the third part is kind of cultural space, which is because of pandemic, it's kind of taking a hit right now. Um, but we used to offer like two to three free art workshops for community. We ran a youth arts program through the space. We would bring in guest speakers and performers and um, do a lot of really cool things in the space. Um, but it was all about creating access for community and highlighting and amplifying the voices of uh, Latinx artists and artists of color and other marginalized communities. Um, we've been doing kind of arts and lecture series like through Zoom and things like that, which I think people are getting that Zoom fatigue right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, we've been super fortunate that community believes in our dream um, and they're, you know, in their shopping in the gift shop, they're supporting the artists in the galleries and things like that. So I highly encourage you if you're ever in Seattle, come uh, visit us. We're open Thursday through Sundays from noon to six. And then um, you want to follow us on Instagram. Um, there's our um, gallery and then just my personal um, art page and our websites. Now another thing is um, if y'all or anyone that's watching is an artist and wants to submit art, um, number one, we do not take a gallery cut. So if you sell your art in the gallery, you get 100% of that sale. Um, I don't know any other galleries that do that, but being an artist and going to place and sell my art and they want like 50% cut, I'm like, that sucks. Uh, so we make our money in the gift shop, we you know, through grants and things like that. So we try to make sure that artists are benefit from their labor. Um, and it's a real, every month we have a new theme and we post those on Instagram and Facebook. And it's just, you email us your submission, you know, if it fits the theme, you know, we, we can select you um, through that process. And um, yeah. So hopefully we get uh, some y'all to submit in the future. All right, so now I just wanna open it up for questions. Um, so hopefully y'all were thinking of some questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yes. Okay, yeah, so um, as far as like I have the original, so access to art is very important to me. 